Today on Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out, we're talking about the biology of belief with Bruce Lipton. What is the biology of belief? What is really controlling your DNA? How are our positive and negative thoughts influencing our biology? What is epigenetics? Learn more about the biology of belief and the power of consciousness in this interview with Bruce Lipton. Are you ready to clear your clutter and share your gifts with the world? I teach you how to navigate the waters to declutter your life, get organized, and become more mindful. Every episode, I'll give you take action steps that you can easily apply to your life. Come on, let's get started. Today, I'm opening up the archives. This is going to be long, longer than usual. It's going to be over an hour. For those of you that prefer that the podcast be longer, you're in luck today. I interviewed Bruce back in 2012. I cannot say enough nice things about this man. When I interviewed him, he was internationally known. He was well known. He came on my little show and he also promoted it. And I have people who aren't well known who want to be a guest and then never promote the show. And I don't have people on the show anymore that don't promote it. When I interview with someone, I always promote their podcast and I expect the same of others that I have on. Anyway, he wrote Biology of Belief. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm holding it up here. It came out with a 10th anniversary edition. That's one I'm reading, can read my bookmark. Highly encourage you to read it. It is amazing. And I have to re-listen to the interview I started to, and I was like, oh, I had forgotten about this interview and how great it was. And you'll share, you'll hear that I share one of my fears. And some things have started to come up, and I reread the book, and I'm working with someone where I have an interview coming up on May, a technique that kind of really relates. It's working on rewiring your brain. I'm really excited about that. And this is such a powerful book. I had said when I first did the interview, I think everyone, every high school student should read this. I think every adult should read this. If you've ever wondered if your thoughts are influencing your physical body, read this book. I really encourage you to check it out. He's also written a couple other books. And hang tight if you are not used to the really long podcast and looking for something shorter. It's over an hour, but Bruce is a gem, and I really encourage you to read it. Hey, everyone. We're going to talk about the biology of belief tonight and the power of consciousness. What does that mean? I'm super excited, as always. We have a great pioneer tonight, Bruce Lipton, and we're going to get to it because we have lots of questions. I filled about 12 hours of worth of questions. So in tonight's Get Off the Couch segment, I'm going to encourage you to find someone that you need to forgive. A lot of times if we fail to forgive someone, we hold on to that resentment and it doesn't do anything to the other person. It harms us. Sometimes it makes us get stuck in life. So for this week, I want to encourage you to look around and see who you can forgive. Maybe it's really hard to forgive that someone that really, really harmed you, but start with someone like who cut you off in traffic and don't spend the rest of the day angry about something. So that's to this week's assignment, to let go of anger and forgiveness. So I'm just going to do a brief bio for Bruce because he insisted on that and is ready to roll and get to questions. Bruce H. Lipton, Ph.D., is an internationally recognized leader in bridging science and spirit, stem cell biologist, best-selling author of The Biology of Belief, and recipient of the 2009 Goy Peace Award. He has been a guest on hundreds of TV and radio shows, as well as a keynote presenter for national and international conferences. Welcome, Bruce! so much and i so appreciate this opportunity to talk to your audience about the new science the new world the, the 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 place we're going into at this exciting time in human history so let's get to it and i have here a copy hopefully you can see this um i said to bruce prior to when we were talking setting up the show i believe the biology of belief should be required reading for all high school students and that it should be a required book and if not for adults. If you haven't read this, I'm going to encourage you to. He's got another book, Spontaneous Evolution, that's out and we'll let him tell you about his one coming out in May. But if you haven't read it, The Biology of Belief. But let's get to it. What is The Biology of Belief, Bruce? 
Well, basically, uh, I was teaching in medical school the conventional concept that genes control our biology was uh, a period called genetic determinism, uh, which we emphasized the nature that our physical and our behavioral and emotional traits were connected to the genes. And when you teach this to a public, what are you actually teaching? And you think about it, it's this. Genes control your fate, and you didn't pick the genes as far as we know. And if you don't like the traits that you have, you can't change the genes. And when you start to put all that together, you realize, oh, my God, genes control my life. I don't control my life. And, and uh, I'm a victim of, of heredity. If I have cancer or Alzheimer's, diabetes running in my family, I can anticipate that uh, likely I will receive such genes that cause these things, and, and this will be my fate as well. So a lot of people look at their family lineage and then predict from that history what their future is going to be because they said, oh, genes did this. So this is what I was teaching in medical school. But at the same time, I was doing research on stem cells, and I want people to know this was 45 years ago. I was cloning stem cells in 1967, and it's very interesting because back then there were just a handful of us in the entire world that even knew what stem cells were. Mm -hmm. uh, they're equivalent of embryonic cells, and I, I can explain the experiment in just one simple uh, minute, and it goes like this. I take one stem cell, put it in a Petri dish by itself, and it divides every 10 to 12 hours. So uh, first there's one cell, then two, four, eight, 16, 32, et cetera. After about a week, I have about 50,000 cells in the Petri dish. But the most important fact is this. All 50,000 cells are genetically identical because they came from the same parent cell. Now, the experiment was to take the cells out of that dish that I was growing them in, split them up into three different Petri dishes, and change the environment in each of the three dishes. So they had genetically identical cells in three different environments. And uh, just think about this. Uh, cells are like fish. They live in an aquarium. So I make culture medium, which is like the aquarium stuff with everything they need in it. And when I change some of the chemistry in that, I change their environment. So what's the point? I have three dishes, genetically identical cells in each dish, but slightly different environment. In one dish, the cells form muscle. The second dish, the cells form bone. And in the third dish, the cells form fat cells. Well, now you're left with a very important question that's so profound. The question is this. What controls the fate of the cells? And the answer is very simple. It's the environment because they were all genetically identical. So I can't say the genes, you know, actually did this. So basically, it led to a new insight through my research of how environmental signals uh, control and regulate gene activity. Well, that 45 years ago was pioneering work for what is now the, the leading edge of a revolutionary new science called epigenetics. Now, the difference of the new science epigenetics and the old science of genetics is profound. When I say genetic control, I'm literally saying control by genes. But when I say epigenetic control, you have to recognize that that little prefix epi means above. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when we say the word skin in, in, in biology and histology, instead of saying the word skin, we say epidermis. And that means above the dermis. That's the layer underneath the skin. So now we're talking about epigenetics. And I say epigenetic control. And I say, oh, literally, control above the genes. And all of a sudden we start to realize genes don't control anything at all. Genes are just blueprints. A uh, blueprint has no on, a blueprint has no off, uh, a blueprint has no idea of what it's even required for its life in the world that it lives in. It's just a blueprint. Uh, I mean, simply think about it this way. You go into an architect's office, and she's working on a blueprint, uh, and you lean over her shoulder and you ask her, and say, is your blueprint on or is your blueprint off? And she'd look at you like, what are you, crazy? It's, it's a blueprint. There's no on and off. And I go, Precisely. A gene is a blueprint. A gene has no on and off. It doesn't know when to be on, when to be off, what to do with it. It doesn't even know what it does. So giving uh, a self-actualization to the genes, which we did, meaning we gave genes the ability to make decisions. We gave genes the ability to turn themselves on and off. Uh, this is the old thinking. The new biology said this is totally, absolutely false. Well, the genes Yes. I was going to say I was relieved when reading your book because my grandmother died of Alzheimer's and I saw that slow 
awful death. And then I read somewhere it skipped generations. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, blah, 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 blah. And it really concerned me. Can you discuss how in your book you talk about the medical students? I thought this was a great example, perfectly fits with your environment, that when you went to the to the Caribbean and that experience and what they were told. And if you could talk about that, because I think that's a great example. Well, uh, I guess basically it's an example of how we influence our lives with our thoughts and with our thinking. And that's really where epigenetics comes in. So maybe if I, let me just take one step back. So I get the audience up to this point, how does the environmental signal affect the genes? And the answer is, uh, it, 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 the signal is picked up by the cell membrane. The cell membrane is the equivalent of the skin. Uh, and when you look at a human in a cell, you can compare them. And I could say, look at our skin. What do we have on it? We have receptors. We have eyes and nose and ears and taste and touch and pain and pressure and temperature. And I say, yes, our receptors read the environment so we can adjust our responses and behavior to that environment. Well, it turns out the cell skin, the cell membrane, also has receptors. And these receptors read the environmental signal and then translate that signal into a biological response. And that's why if I take the cells from uh, one environment and put it into another environment, the environmental signals are different, and the environmental signals influence which genes are going to be read. And then let's connect the last piece, and then the, the rest of the discussion will really make a lot of sense. And it goes like this. When cells are living alone, like an amoeba in a pond, it reads directly whatever the environmental information is and makes a direct response to that. Bruce, we have a caller for you who's been on a couple times, and, and Amnon has a technical... Uh, yes. Bruce, the microphone, either you are hitting it with your hands when you're talking or yeah. or it's too close to your mouth. So put it back think, on the side. I think it was too close, so I'll stand back here. How's that? Is that, that better? is fine, yeah. Now, okay. who do we have on? Hello? We have our caller. Hello? Hi, who's this? Okay, you, we need you to turn down. Okay, hopefully they'll call back. Sorry about that. And if you have a question for Bruce, you can Skype in at Computers 2K Voice, ask a question on chat, I'm happy to get to it, or call 919-518-9773. I'm sorry about that, Bruce. I didn't mean to interrupt your thought there. Yeah, well, uh, if I finish this point, then all the rest of the conversation can hinge together on this, this point. Okay. And it goes like this. The, the fate of a cell in a plastic Petri dish is based on the environment in which the cells live. Simple point, take a healthy dish of cells and put it into a negative environment. The cells will get sick. They'll begin to die. Uh, and you may look at them and uh, a physician might say, well, Bruce, your cells are sick. You, you need to give them some medicine. And I go, absolutely not. If I want my cells to get well, all I have to do is simply take the dish from the bad environment, put it back in a good environment, and the cells will instantaneously get well again. Now, this is about cells in a plastic dish. And now we want to say, well, what does this mean to me as a human being? And here's a, a, a fun point, uh, uh, an exciting, interesting point is this. We look in the mirror. Julie, you look there. You see your beautiful self looking back. I look in the mirror. I see Bruce looking back. And we say, oh, yeah, these are single human individuals. And I go, well, yeah, that's what we perceive. But let's be more truthful about it. The fact is a human is made out of about 50 trillion cells like amoebas. 50 trillion amoebas, that's essentially what we're made out of. So a human body is not a one thing. A human body is a community of 50 trillion cells. So here's a simple uh, joke uh, that's real. Uh, a human is a skin-covered Petri dish. Underneath our skin, 50 trillion cells growing in a growth medium. The growth medium is called blood. The composition of the blood... Uh, affects the cells in exactly the same way as the composition of the growth medium affects the cells in the plastic Petri dish. And then the, the last connecting piece is this. What ultimately controls the composition of the blood in your body, and the blood is the culture medium for 50 trillion cells, uh, what controls the chemistry of that? And the answer is the mind. And the significance about that is our cells are growing in a skin-covered Petri dish. And our cells respond to our interpretation of the world, and our interpretation is translated by the brain from visions and beliefs and attitudes into chemistry. And as we change our perceptions of the world or we change our beliefs and our attitudes, we change the chemistry. So, for example, uh, if you're sitting there and you open your eyes and you see someone you love, 
the brain will translate that love into chemistry like dopamine, the pleasure chemical. It will translate it into oxytocin, the bonding chemical, uh, vasopressin, a uh, uh, sexual attraction chemical, uh, growth hormone. Uh, and so in other words, if you're in love and your mind perceives love, the chemistry that comes from that brain and goes into the blood are these wonderful agents I mentioned. And if I put those chemicals in a plastic Petri dish with cells, guess what? Cells grow beautifully. But then on the other hand, I say same person opens their eyes and sees something that scares them. Well, they're not releasing the love chemicals. Now they're going to release stress hormones. They're going to release inflammatory agents, uh, uh, all, all these things like epinephrine, norepinephrine. They, they get us ready for fight or flight, these things. And, and basically they said, oh, you changed the chemistry of the culture medium. Now the cells are not in a state of growth because when those chemicals released by fear are dropped into the system, they cause the cells to shut down their growth. My point is this. It doesn't make a difference if the cell's in a plastic Petri dish or a skin-covered Petri dish. The genetics and behavior of the cell are controlled by the culture medium. In the plastic dishes, I personally manipulate the culture medium and control the fate of the cells. In our skin-covered Petri dishes, our mind and our brain cooperate to control the chemistry of the growth medium, which in turn controls the genetics and the behavior of the cell. As we thinketh, we become. This is the whole thing. And it's an ancient understanding, but now there's a modern understanding through epigenetics about how our beliefs and our attitudes affect our behavior, uh, affect our genetics. And the significance about that is that then we are not victims of genes. What we are are masters of our biology for a very simple reason. We're the ones that control the chemistry by the way we think and respond and, uh, uh, to, to the life uh, that we're living. We're the ones that can change that response. But and that can, can really shake people at their core beliefs because I believe we live in a society where lots of us are victims. And I unfortunately speak from personal experience. When I figured out I'm a victim, I changed that and my life changed. I mean, I literally physically used to be like this, and now I'm like this. I mean, I've seen it in myself. And there's a direct connection of what you said to the real science as well, because basically it says this. The mind, we got down to this fact. Cells are controlled by the environment. The environment in the body is the blood. The blood chemistry is controlled by the brain and really the mind, which interprets the environment, and then translates that interpretation into chemistry, which controls the growth medium. So basically it says our mind is the ultimate deter determining factor of the chemistry of our blood, which in turn is the ultimate determining factor of the health of our cells. Now, now comes the interesting part, which you brought up, and this is fundamental to everybody out there in the world. It goes like this. There are two parts to the mind. <laughs> There's the conscious mind, which is the one connected to our personality, our spirit, who we are. Uh, our uniqueness is in our conscious mind. This is the latest evolution of the nervous system. It's right behind our forehead here. It's a prefrontal cortex. Uh, and this gives us our the subconscious is the entire rest of the brain that was there before this uh, piece in the front evolved. So the subconscious is this massive part of the brain. But here's the fundamental difference. And when people know this, this is where self-empowerment comes from. And it goes like this. Your mind controls the biology of your cells. And this is uh, the basis of the placebo effect. You know, basically, everyone's familiar with that. That's where the mind believes this, this procedure is going to heal I take the, the procedure, uh, get healed, and find out it was a sugar pill, and the procedure was just a, a sham operation or whatever. It didn't. It didn't do anything. What resulted? What caused the healing? The answer is, the belief in the healing caused the healing. So uh, this is a, a well-known, well-recognized uh, experience of how belief controls this. Are you surrounded by clutter? Are you exhausted from the stress your clutter creates? Are you anxious every time you walk into your home? Do you long for peace of mind? Go to reawakenyourbrilliance.com to learn how I can support you.
now I have to say, here's where the problem comes from. The subconscious mind doesn't really have an entity in it. The conscious mind has you in it. The subconscious mind is more like a machine. It records experiences and on repetition learns them and, and then creates a pro- so it's like an old fashioned jukebox. The records in there are called programs. And every time you push the button, you play the same program over and over and over again. If you push the same button, it will play it forever. Uh, it's a recording. Uh, and this is in the subconscious mind. The conscious mind is actually a, uh, a creative mind with a real life entity, you inside of it. So the conscious mind is creative and has, guess what? This is the most important part. The conscious mind has your wishes and your desires and what you want from life, your positive thinking, your placebo effect. It's all in the conscious mind. Now, the significance is this, and this is the catch. And if you understand the catch and you understand why we lost control, and it goes like this. We believe we run our lives with our wishes and our desires and our aspirations that come from our conscious mind. The conscious mind is unique because a conscious mind is not time bound. Conscious mind can, I say, Julie, what are you doing next week? You have an answer. I say, Julie, what'd you do last week? You could take your mind and go backwards and that. Or I say, okay, for a minute, daydream, just disconnect and visualize something up in your head. The, this little uh, uh, you know, bit of information is it. The conscious mind doesn't have to stay in the present moment. Conscious mind on thinking disconnects from the present moment. The con- can, can wander, uh, and, but here's the point. Every time the conscious mind is not paying attention to the moment, then your life is being controlled by the your subconscious mind because the subconscious mind is the default mind. The subconscious mind uh, lives in the present moment. It doesn't know a, a history and a future. The, the subconscious mind is always in the present. If, if uh, you could speak to your subconscious mind, you say, when did I learn how to walk? Uh, it would say, today. You learned how to walk today. Uh, so here's the point. Conscious mind, you, wishes, desires, aspirations, positive thinking, uh, is a very creative mind, but it's always engaged in thinking. So it's not always present. It turns out to be present only about 5% of the time. Why is that important? The answer is this. By, because if your conscious mind is present only 5% of the time, then your subconscious mind is running the show 95% of the time. And now comes the big bomb. And, and here's where it is. The fundamental subconscious mind did not come from you at all. They came from your family, your community, your local environment. Uh, this, you copy this because in the first seven years of your life, your brain is operating at a low EEG, electroencephalograph frequency called theta. Think imagination. So that's why kids, especially between six, are always mixing the real world and the imaginary world together. But think it's also hypnosis. And the relevance about that is we have to learn thousands and thousands of facts to be an, a, a functioning member in a community. And nature created a very interesting way of getting those facts. It just made hypnosis the operating state of the mind for the first seven years. You observe your father, your mother, your, your family members, your community, you observe everyone, you record in your subconscious mind because it's in a, in a state of hypnosis, you record how all people in different levels respond to each other, how your father or your mother responds to uh, issues or stress in their life, uh, you will pattern yourself after that because you're recording it. What now would comes- you say to someone who has lots of negative thinking. I, you know, joke, I'm a half full kind of gal and I have a dear friend. He is half empty. <laughs> no, so what, this, would you, what would you say to him? We have to be, first of all, very careful of our thoughts. We may be joking about them, but when we are saying thoughts in our head, which we repeat conversation, for example, those thoughts are not just going outwards. The thoughts are going inwards. How? And the answer is, when you say words the brain will release the chemistry to manifest that particular experience. So uh, if you have a negative thought, you will create a negative chemistry in the body to to complement that negative thought. As a matter of fact, very important, a placebo effect, a positive thought causing a positive response, such as a healing. Uh, What I didn't mention, and you just brought up, 
is the most important fact because it's not in our thinking. And that is, it's the power of thought that controls the biology. Positive thought will do a placebo uh, experience and give you something wonderful out of it. But a negative thought is equally powerful as a positive thought, but it works in the opposite direction. And, and there's a name for it in the medical community. The positive uh, thinking uh, uh, response is called the placebo effect. The negative response is called the nocebo effect. And what's significance about it? The nocebo effect can make you sick and can actually kill you with the same power that a placebo thought can heal you and make you well. And when we start having a lot of negative thoughts and negative chatter, uh, we are releasing a chemistry complementary to that and creating a biology and a behavior that will totally complement that belief system. And that's why it's very important to, when we start saying things unconsciously, that's really important because what it really represents is you have this as an operating pro subconscious mind. Then go back and say, 5% of the time you're going in that positive direction of, oh, I want to be healthy, I, I want to be in love, I want to have a great job and all that. That's really great. That's five time. That's where you're moving. 95% of the time, and the reason is this, 95% of the time our mind is in thought, thinking about yesterday, the job, the future, whatever. And the significance is if the conscious mind is in thought, then that's why we play 95% from the subconscious program. And now comes uh, another catch. I hope all these catch things out so then it makes a foundation for what we really want to talk about, Julie. Uh, another catch point is this. When you are playing a subconscious program because your conscious mind is not paying attention, then it also has to be recognized your conscious mind didn't see the program either. I have a great, I want to share this with you. I think this will help our, our viewers. Mariella writes, knowing the difference of what the conscious and subconscious do was very helpful for me to realize that most of my fears came from patterns that, w that were put in me when I was a young girl. I took responsibility for my actions going forward and fear is gone now. Thank you very much, dear Bruce Lipton. Because this is exactly the whole topic of what we're trying to get around to, and that is this. Um... I have a subconscious belief. The fundamental subconscious beliefs are not mine. I got them from other people. So playing 95% subconscious beliefs, I'm not necessarily playing anything that will support or get me to my goal or encourage anything that I want. I could be sabotaging myself completely, shooting myself in the foot and never see it. And when I have a lecture and I give a lecture, I, I tell the audience a story that they almost all are familiar with I'm sure you go back in your history, you had a friend, and you were very close to your friend, you knew your friend's behavior very well, and you also knew your friend's parent. And the significance is one day you notice that your friend shares some of the same behavior as their parent, and you casually volunteer, you say something like, hey, Bill, mm -hmm. you're just like your dad. Mm -hmm. And back away from Bill. Because Bill's the guy that goes ballistic that says, how can you compare that? <laughs> okay? And, and, and why is that relevant? And, and there's two points. Same story, two points. Point number one, everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. It's only Bill who doesn't see it. Simple reason. Because he downloaded behavior from his dad in the first seven years of his life. He plays dad's behavior when his conscious mind's not paying attention. So using or doing this behavior even doesn't see it and that's the problem because if this behavior is not supportive then you don't have a an awareness that you're actually undermining your own life with these negative and, and uh, this becomes so important because the second of that story is we are all every one of us unconsciously plays we have downloaded in the first seven years of our lives that we downloaded from other people that we play these programs they interfere with our lives and we don't see it significance when life doesn't work out we have a tendency to go well i wanted it to work out that was my intention and since it didn't work out the universe is against me and all of a sudden i'm a victim mm -hmm. and it turned no we were never victims from outside forces we were always victims, in a sense, and I use that with quotes, from inside. 
and that this programming on a, on a national and on a, on, a, on a global level, psychologists reveal that that first seven year pr is significantly a 70% or more a negative pr self-sabotaging programming and we unconsciously and when our life doesn't go right we never saw that we were a participant in that process and so it's a wake-up call because the new biology is the biology of how your thoughts are translated by your brain into chemistry and the chemistry goes through the body in the form of called blood and the culture medium controls the fate of the cells just as it did in the plastic dish experiment. It's exactly the same. Uh, and so if we wanted to sum said in one simple moment, I would say this. Uh, there's a great movie called The Matrix. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, that's a science fiction movie. And what I would like to suggest, no, The Matrix is a documentary. Hmm. <laughs> And we have to get out of the program, uh, whether you take a red or you do something to take self-empowerment back into your life. Until you do that, we become victims of this unconscious, subconscious, below our awareness behavior that was and skeptical about this. This is interesting. Well, we're just finding out a scientific validation for this understanding. Bruce, Bruce, hold, hold your thought. Put the mic back where it was because we're losing you completely. It, it, I'd rather hear you, the puffs and everything, than than not. I, no, is that that's not, no, that's not good. Not good. Uh, how about if I disconnect this and just try the computer microphone? Let's it's try really that. Am I still there? Yes. Is that, how's that one? Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. So... What we we're leaving off basically is simply saying this is that the uh, the movie uh, uh, the Matrix is is a real movie and it reveals that uh, something that we haven't paid attention to is that we've all been programmed and that most of the programming is programming of limitation and self sabotaging and the insidious part is when we play these programs subconsciously they're invisible to us so we never even see we're participating in that particular program. Now, here, here's the fun part because it's related to the new book that will be coming out in, the, in May. And it goes like this. I said the subconscious mind is the habits and the download experiences. Uh, I, I was getting into the point when we got interrupted about the microphone, I just realized was um, the Jesuits for 500 years boasted that give me a child and I will show you the man. That's a nice biblical way of saying it. Or they would say more directly, give me a child until it's six or seven and will belong to the church for the rest of its life. My point for bringing that up is the concept of programming the child in the first six or seven years was, has been known for 500 years. Uh, the Jesuits, I said, they said, if I get the education into the child in the first seven years, it makes no difference what their personal wishes and desires are from their conscious mind. They will inevitably uh, express the subconscious programs uh, to a much higher degree and manifest the life that matches the subconscious. Uh, now, the exciting part about the, the new book that I'm talking about is this. I say, well, the subconscious has the habits and the programs mainly from other people. Uh, and the conscious mind is your wishes and your desires. And then I would ask you a question. What do you think would happen that rather than living on 5% of our uh, conscious mind, what if we actually were uh, a process we call mindfulness, uh, living from our conscious wishes and desires uh, 90 to 95% of the time? Uh, I say, what would your life look like? And I say, I already have an answer for you. And the answer is this. Go back to a time in your life where you fell in love, you know, big time, head over heels in love. Uh, and, and that fresh love that was so exciting. Uh, I asked people, uh, go back to that time, and I uh, three questions. Number one, when you had just fallen in love like that and you were experiencing what I now call the honeymoon effect, were you healthy? And almost everybody says, I was exuberantly healthy. Simple reason, when you fall in love, you release the chemistry uh, dopamine, oxytocin, vasopressin, etc., that actually enhances the vitality of cells. That's why love is so exciting. Okay, 
number two, I asked people, did, did you have energy when you fell in love? And they all laughed because they know they made love for days without stopping for food or, you know, sleep. They were overflowing with energy. But more importantly, the last question I ask is, when you were in that deep love state, whether it lasted a, a week or a month or a year, when you were in that deep love state, didn't you look forward to the next day to have more of that beautiful experience on this planet? Was it parallel to having like heaven on earth? And why I bring that up is this, because we now know why that honeymoon experience was created. We know why it was so wonderful. We know why that up to the minute you met this person, your life may have sucked, and all of a sudden you meet this person, and now it's like, I'm living heaven on earth. You say, what's the difference? And the answer is this. Science has recognized that when you fall in love like that, it's the one time in your life where you almost strictly operate from your conscious mind, the mind with wishes and desires. And why is that important? When two people are living both from wishes and desires and what they want out of life and cognitively creating then they create exactly that. That's called heaven on earth. And then you say, yeah, but the honeymoon goes away. And I go, and here's the reason why. The reason why it goes away is that inevitably life still gets busy. You got to pay the rent. You got to fix the car. You got chores to do and all these things. And why that becomes relevant is simply this. It goes like this. It says, if I'm thinking about fixing the car, paying the rent, then my conscious mind is now preoccupied. My loving partner I'm having a honeymoon with comes up, asks me a simple loving question, but I'm thinking with, you know, about thoughts of paying the rent or something. I turn around and make a response to her and I go, blah, blah, blah. And she looks at me going, who are mm -hmm. you? Where'd that behavior come from? And all of a sudden you realize this is the beginning of the end of the honeymoon. What is it that did it? And the answer is this. The honeymoon is solely based on your wishes, desires, and what you want from life. And when two people do that together, it's heaven on earth. That's what you created. That's what you fear. You experience that. When life starts to get busy, your conscious mind wanders. You're, all of a sudden, you go to the default. But the default's a subconscious mind. And guess what? Fundamental programs in a subconscious mind are not even yours. They may be your mother's, your father's, your relatives and your family or your community. Something you picked up. Significance is this. You introduce into the honeymoon new behaviors that were never derived from the conscious mind. Uh, and these behaviors in the subconscious mind don't necessarily support you or even in any way encourage your relationship. And when you do this, you don't see it. And so the significance is the honeymoon starts to get lost when this change occurs. And here's what the change is. The honeymoon is created two conscious minds acting with each other. The honeymoon is lost when four minds come in. The two conscious minds which started the whole thing off and the two subconscious minds which have completely different programs than the wishes and desires you hold in your conscious mind. When these behaviors show up like your mother's or your father's behavior start to enter in the relationship, your partner goes, hey, this isn't what we signed up for. <laughs> Where'd this come from? You know, hey, if you'd done this on day one, there may have not have been a day two for us. You know, uh, what happens is we compromise. We have to say, well, OK, I can accept those behaviors. They're not great and everything. And it irritates me a lot. But I, I love all the good stuff. So I'll accept this bad stuff a little bit. But as more of them get introduced into more of these unconscious, subconscious behaviors get introduced in a relationship. They start bringing in behaviors that are not very supportive of the relationship. The compromises continue. They can get so great that, the, that you can't compromise anymore, and that relationship is over. And then you're left there thinking, how the hell did something so beautiful go so bad? Can you easily navigate the ups and downs of life? Are you tired of feeling stuck? The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. If you are ready to take that first step, go to reawakenyourbrilliance.com to learn how I can support you in creating the life you desire. Bad. 
can you? Well, I'll be answer. first in line to buy that book. You said it's coming out in May. I'm kind of in the honeymoon phase now, so I will be getting that book. Now, Bruce, we've got a couple questions here for you, and I'd like to get to yes. them first. I want to share this. Um, this is from a longtime viewer who's had a very amazing journey, was bipolar, and has completely changed her life. And her name is Joy, and she said, You are on her bucket list to shake hands with and thank in person someday for being such an integral part of her education on the power of love. And her question for you is about the power of love to heal. She has heard how you speak, how it turns DNA back on, and she'd like you to talk about that and also wants to know, does it turn back on the spiritual DNA? Okay. Um, A good understanding about it is this. Positive thoughts about a positive vision send messages to the cells that the future is good, the future is bright, this is what we're looking for. The chemistry from the brain uh, it, it changes the genetic activity to a healthy uh, response uh, of an organism that is, is in harmony with the world and the environment. And the significance about that is basically we did this just with our thoughts. Uh, a very interesting study by uh, 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 a great uh, internist here in San Francisco area. His name uh, uh, is, uh, okay, just popped out. Where's that neuron? Uh, um, okay. <laughs> I, I, I know him now. I'm going to be really upset. Uh, Dean Ornish. <laughs> Dean Ornish. Um, he recently worked with prostate cancer patients. And what did he do? He, he took a group of prostate patients uh, and said, look, instead of doing the conventional treatment with radiation, chemotherapy, whatever it else, he said, forget that. For 90 days, I want to take these patients. And all I'm going to do is give them stress reduction techniques teach them a meditation technique or two, change their diet around, uh, and just help them uh, find a a more enjoyable expression of life. 90 days, 500 genes changed their activity in 90 days of just changing lifestyle. And basically, the the most prominent gene changes were changes in genes that were promoting the the cancer were inhibited or canceled. And, and all of a sudden, it really reflects something that uh, even the American Cancer Society has finally come around to recognize, and that is this. Only about 10% of cancer has any hereditary linkage to it. 90% of cancer is totally the consequence of lifestyle and living out of harmony with the world in which we live. And, and so changing the beliefs have now been totally demonstrated to absolutely change the genetic readout of the system. And the significance about that is it shows that we are empowered. We're the ones that can change the genetic readout. Don't go look for chemicals and pharmaceutical agents and all that stuff like that. All the chemistry you need is right here. uh, And and recognize this, 95% of the population arrived on this planet with a genome, uh, uh, you know, a, a composition of genes that should allow them to have a healthy, happy, prosperous existence on this planet. They all got here with good genes, 95% of us. And then you say, well, what about all the illness that affects this 95% population? The answer is this, can't blame the genes, can't blame the heredity on this thing at all. We have to recognize now that it's the way we live, the lifestyle, and our responses to the world that are controlling this. And basically, it is putting together the new biology is revealing the mind-body connection, not in a uh, miracle black box magic something happens. The new science reveals the direct connection, how a thought in the mind is translated into chemistry by the brain, and the chemistry is released into the blood, and through epigenetics, that chemistry uh, selects and modifies the genes that you that you arrived here with. So basically, uh, cancer is derived mainly with, with people with normal genomes. It wasn't the genes that we always say, "Oh, the cancer gene did it." it turns out, no, it wasn't the cancer gene. It was it was a way of life. Uh, there, there's a very small percent that has uh, a real hereditary linkage to it, but most of it, again, is lifestyle. Again, cardiovascular disease, ninety percent has been recognized by medicine to be nothing wrong with the biology of the individual other than the lifestyle which uh, changes the culture medium to a non 
supportive growth medium for the cells of the body. Uh, and this is true for diabetes as well. And all the big diseases, only a, a small little clutch of about five diseases that we can uh, directly attribute to genes. The rest of diseases are multi-gene variations that require not a, one gene turning on and off, but a, a whole gang of genes being selectively activated or suppressed. And all of a sudden you realize health or ill health is is not a coincidence or an accident. It's a manifestation of our of our own biology, and it's time for us to, to know that. And the problem is this. Without an education about this new science, the average public is still left in the same place I was in 1970, teaching medical students that genes control their lives, and they're all walking around in this victim mode because they recognize, I, I'm not controlling my life. My genes control it, when in fact... They're the masters. Now, there are a couple questions here, and it brought up a question for me. Tylenol Jones writes, does exercising change the genetic readout? And Warrior Spirit says, well, vegan diet help us with better genes. And so that made me think, when you hear about someone who's 40 and he's a marathon runner and then he drops dead of a heart attack, would I rather be Julie and a little bit of chunk on me but really positive thinking, or do I want to be... A skinny ch chiquita with tons of negative thoughts, or are they balanced? What are your thoughts on that? Everything's a balance point. And in fact, the, the interesting thing about food is that we always have this vision, and this is a mistaken vision, that you put something in your mouth and that's in your body. And the fact is, that, first of all, that's totally false for a simple reason. Your digestive tract is a tube, like an intestine. A stomach is just a blown up part of the tube. The esophagus is a tube that goes from your mouth uh, goes down into the stomach, then we go through the intestine, and we come out the anus. And I say, if I could dissect out your digestive tract, stretch it out in a straight line, I could put a flashlight at one end of the tube, and it will shine out the other end of the tube. What, what's the point? When you put food into your gut, into your mouth, into, into your digestive system, the food's not part of your body. It's, it's still in a pipe. It has to come across the wall of the pipe. And when it goes through the wall of the pipe, that enters the body. And then I say, ah, does everything go through the wall of the pipe? And the answer is, no. Nope. It's what the body deems is necessary for what the body is trying to create. So uh, you could eat the most wonderful macrobiotic diet and have, you know, like a cancer issue and say, well, I'm eating the right food. And I'm going, it's irrelevant if your mind isn't encouraging health. It won't pick up the nutrients from that macrobiotic diet. You'll die just as fast, if not faster, with a macrobiotic diet. Uh, and, and so we have to recognize that there's biology, there's mind, and the mind overrides all aspects of that biology. Uh, a simple point is this. Um, down south, we have uh, fundamentalists work themselves up into a state of religious ecstasy. Uh, and many people are familiar with some of them. They're called serpent handlers. They play with poisonous snakes, rattlesnake, copperhead snakes. Uh, and, and when they play with these snakes in this state of mind, what are they doing? They're, they're testifying. Uh, and I say, what does testifying mean? He says, they're showing their belief in the power of God. And they're saying, God will protect me from these serpents. And when they get bitten by these serpents, they, they really don't have very much of a negative effect. And I go, okay cool, the serpent handlers, let's jump one notch higher. And there are these people that drink strychnine in toxic doses to demonstrate that God will protect them from this poison. What's the point? No harmful effect. They drink absolute strychnine poison and have no harmful effect. Now, all of a sudden it says, what does it mean? It says, just because you drank the poison, it's not really in your body. <laughs> it didn't get in your body yet. Your body determines what's going to come in. And with that belief system, as strong as it is, uh, even drinking strychnine doesn't affect them. So you say, well, what does that mean? I say, well, if you can drink strychnine and not have an effect, then you could eat a Twinkie and not have an effect as well. Or you, or you, could, eat, or you could smoke cigarettes and not have an effect. Uh, the whole idea is this. The ultimate effect is primarily the effect that is manifested by the mind. If the mind says... This is a diet that I absolutely know is going to work for me. That that diet is going to work. Cheesecake, <laughs> here I come.
Are you anxious? Do you feel exhausted? Are you constantly stressed out? Do you feel like you are losing your mind? Are you ready to get your life back? Go to reawakenyourbrilliance.com to learn how I can support you in getting your life back on track. Yeah, but first get your mind fixed. You got to have your mind fixed. Oh, I, I'm working on that. Trust me. We got a bunch more questions. Biohound wants to know, is the base of what you're saying is we create our destiny? Absolutely. This is, there's less than 5% of the people who arrived on this planet with, with, with genetic defects that will impair their life, less than 5%. We actually put them in a group called birth defects. They're the ones that it's just like some cars come off the assembly line. It's a lemon. You know, that's just the way it is. You can't, that's the way it is. So, but it's less than 5% of the people. And we can do something with them on a separate level. What I'm trying to address this to is 95% of the people. And the answer to that question, as we just heard, uh, uh, asked it, is basically we are controlling everything. Conscious, uh, consciousness is, is what quantum physicists have recognized creates the world in which we live. Consciousness is not just a little side effect of a human biology. It's a manifestation or the, the creator of the world in which we live. And that is straight out of quantum physics uh, because they started to recognize that it's consciousness that uh, determines the experiences that we have on this planet. And you can change your consciousness and you can change your experiences. Now, the issue about weight, uh, that becomes an important one because weight is not uh, in your conscious mind. Weight is a setting in your subconscious mind. It, you set a particular weight during your development based on how you were treated by the world. If you were abused, especially, then the system will put weight on. Now, why would it do that? There are a couple of reasons. One is I'm thicker. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the, whatever's out there trying to bother me, it's, it, it's going to have a much more difficult time to bother me. I'm thicker. Uh, I'm protected by this thickness. Psychologically, it also is protected as nobody will bother me because I am bigger. And I'm not saying this is the conscious mind. It has nothing to do with the conscious mind. It has everything to do with the experiences acquired during the first seven years of life, which includes the last trimester of pregnancy, in fact. Uh, and so when people want to lose weight, what they're doing is in their conscious, creative mind, wishes and desires say, oh, yes, I would love to be this thin and, and be this healthy, irregardless of what I eat. Uh, and I say, well, that's great. Uh, what is the program in your subconscious mind? Only for the simple reasons this. Conscious mind works 5% of the time. 95% of the time, you're going to go to whatever setting of weight has been determined by your experiences in your subconscious mind. That's why many people can forcibly keep their, present, their mind present, control their diet, get down to a weight uh, that they want, and the moment they let go, the subconscious will kick them right back up to that weight again. And other people will try and lose weight, for example, and the subconscious mind will, will not allow that to this extent. They eat less and less, even to a point where they're eating fewer calories than have been determined that they need, and they still gain weight because we now recognize the subconscious can regulate the metabolism. So as you start to eat less, the body will want to maintain its weight so what it does is just reduces metabolic activity so that uh, uh, you're not going to lose any weight. And, and we keep trying to work with the conscious mind. Yeah, the conscious mind is the one, yeah, you go and lose weight. This is a great idea. This is, you're going to really love this. And I'm going to go, great idea, big problem, is because you're only operating 5% of the time with your conscious mind. Until you say, change the subconscious program, that's a preset point, for example, about weight or behavior or any other thing that's programmed the subconscious. And, and, and this is the biggest issue of all. And that's why I brought up the honeymoon effect, because I want people to recognize what happened when you stopped operating from that subconscious and all of a sudden you realize you manifested heaven on earth. And I say, yeah, that's our destination. Uh, and if you can rewrite the subconscious limitations, then heaven on earth could be an everyday experience for you for the rest of your life on this planet. Well, I'm ready to do that. Now, we've got an excellent question from Mariella who writes, GMOs are a popular talk nowadays. If I eat vegetables, grains, or fruit thinking they are healthy based on the placebo effect, even GMOs will not affect me. Is that correct? I think it's a great question. Well, 
down to the level of, I said, look, if you can drink strychnine and not be affected by it, then what the hell's the difference between a twink and a GMO when it comes to that? But then here comes the biggest problem. The biggest problem is this. We've programmed already. As I said, that story about Bill not, you know, recognizing he has those traits from his father. Uh, I said, we all those things. And until you have cleared your subconscious programming, uh, which was actually put in there before the age of seven, and, and now there's even information that suggests that half of our personality is even created before we're born, uh, then all of a sudden you start to realize is that you have a lot of programming in there that you have no awareness of. Uh, and and then you might be saying, oh, my God, now you just throw me a bigger problem. I, I'm programmed, and I don't even know what the programs are. And then I go, okay, let's simplify it. And it goes like this. Our lives are 95% controlled by our subconscious programs. Point. Our lives are a printout of our subconscious programs. Whatever works for you in your life, whatever comes easily to you in your life, does because you have beliefs that encourage and support that. Whatever you work on, whatever you have to put an effort in, whatever you struggle over, whatever you sweat over, you're doing all that extra effort because you're trying to override a program that does not support that destination. So it says, oh, great. I don't have to go to a psychoanalysis and find out who did what to me and when and cry and go through that all that stuff. I, don't. I just look at my life right now and say, the things that are working work because I have beliefs and encourage those. And the things that I struggle with, I recognize those are the places in my subconscious programming that express limitation and, and uh, um, self-sabotage. That, that's an aha moment for me. That just really, uh, that's huge. Because now yeah. I know in the areas that I need to change, but I've just recently discovered how I was able to overcome one of those. So uh, I know it can be done. We have a, one last question here from Tylenol Jones who asks, so after exercising, I feel great both physically and mentally. Is that the act of exercising that makes me feel this way or something the mind has done to cause this feeling? But, but, uh, because A, you do the exercise with an intention. And so when you manifest that intention, you are fulfilling what you're looking for. And B, you are improving the circulation, uh, the clearing of the tissue of, of uh, uh, negative stuff in there, you know, metabolic byproducts, debris, whatever's going on, because as you increase the circulation, you're bringing fresh energy and uh, and building blocks and nutrients to the cells and flushing out the old system. Of course, that's like giving a spring clean to, to, to the cell's environment. So exercise is critical. It's very critical, too. Uh, uh, let me get a simple point like this. It goes like this. It says, um, Think of, uh, of consciousness as uh, on a chart going from uh, zero up to 100%. So it looks like that, okay? And then I go, think sport, which means uh, nutrition, you know, uh, uh, exercise, everything you do to support yourself. So we have uh, consciousness going on this chart. And then what we have is support. I'm trying to put this on my camera. I'm not doing very well, okay? Uh -huh. and it, this and what the point is this when you have no consciousness then you need every bit of support you can get 100 percent support as your consciousness level goes up the need for that support goes down so if we can become in a a, a master state like jesus or or buddha or something like that it says hey you could eat or you could not eat it doesn't make any difference really uh you could walk on fire or you could walk on water you can do these things but until we're there, then we, it's best for all of us to understand this. Until we reach that level of mastery, then anything that we can do to enhance our life, eat organic food, eat natural food, okay? Drink lots of water, uh, avoid the chemistry <laughs> that the, the agribusiness is, is killing us with. Avoid things like high fructose corn syrup, which are destructive to the system. Uh, there, there, there's so much of this going on. Uh, and what's happening in the population is this. The population is being stressed. And the population is also being malnourished by the agribusiness. And the, the, the two come together, the complementation of stress and lousy diet are, are two things that knock us right out of the picture. In fact, uh, the American Psychological Association has recognized that 
90 uh, percent of doctor visits, doctor visits, 90 percent are due to stress. And all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, we are innately able to heal ourselves, but it's the stress that we buy into the stress of our our subconscious programs that challenge us because they don't uh, encourage the wishes and desires of the conscious mind. That's stress right there because that means your conscious mind's always trying to succeed and your subconscious mind is tearing it apart. So that's internal stress. Then we look at the world and we see the environment changing and everything is going upside down and people are stressed like crazy. And I just hope that they understand that uh, this falling apart, I just want to say this before we end because I don't want to leave it this way. This falling apart of civilization that we're experiencing right now and all of us can feel in our gut that something is going on is not a coincidence or an accident. We are in an evolutionary upheaval at this moment. It's something even the candidates for presidency don't even want to talk about for a simple reason is this. The issue is science has recognized that because of human behavior, uh, we are creating the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet. Five times in the history of this planet, life essentially got wiped out and started all over again. And then, uh, uh, and this has happened in the past, but it's been due to things like comets or asteroids hitting the Earth or massive geological activity with earthquakes and volcanoes just wiping out life in the environment. We are at this stage that science has now recognized we're in the sixth mass extinction of life. And we're losing species of organisms on this planet faster than in the previous five mass extinctions. But the cause of this mass extinction is much closer to home than that comet. It's human behavior. And so what does it mean is this? We continue what we're doing right now and live the way we think we're living right now. We are on an on a accelerated track to extinction. Einstein gave us the most perfect quote and applies to this moment exactly as says, you cannot solve the problems with the same thinking that created the problems. Who's creating the problems that we're experiencing today? Academia, politics, economy, uh, uh, religious organizations, with their old belief systems shaping our culture and our way of life, that way of life has now become destructive. And as Einstein said, we're not going to resolve it by continuing the same thinking. So when you look at the world and you see all the crises, that are affecting the economy and uh, people are going to school not getting educated can't even get jobs uh, health care doesn't work anymore uh, you know governments are failing and all that and people are going oh oh you know it's the end and I'm going no no it's the first step of the beginning because we have to change the way the culture lives on this planet we have to change the understanding of who we are for each human is a cell in the body of a superorganism called humanity. The human, the human body, we're not evolving. We did that. What's evolving is the community of humans. We've been separated and pushed apart, challenging each other, competing with each other, and this is totally antagonistic to evolution because evolution says it's the coming together of wholeness and community that will allow us to survive on this planet. Therefore, when you see what's falling apart, you'll see those are the institutions that have kept us apart. So I get very excited if you understand what's going on. We're creating an opportunity for a new foundation, for a new civilization and a new way of life. Uh, and the young people, uh, which now have a name, uh, because the old baby boomers, now we have something post-baby boomers, people 40 years and under are part of what are called the millennial generation. And guess what? They are the future of the civilization. And while they look at the world around them and go, oh, my God, I can't even get a job. I can't even take care of myself. Uh, and they're feeling left out. I want them to understand this is an important part of it. And the reason is this. The civilization can hold itself in a stable position if everybody holds on to it and says, don't change it. But we have now 50% of the population that are part of the millennials, and they could give a damn if the system falls apart. What does it mean? We get half the population that doesn't care if the structure falls apart is exactly what is necessary to enable the structure to fall apart. So we're right on schedule. And what we really have to do is not get caught up in what's going down. We have to get caught up in what's being built, a new civilization, 
a civilization based on uh, a global community where people uh, are not in competition but are in total cooperation. Uh, completely different cultural beliefs than we're operating by right now, but we're engaged in it right now. And that's why I wanted to get this off to the people for a very important point is because I want you to see while you see chaos in the world, this is not negative. This is the most important step toward the evolution of a civilization that can thrive on this planet. And we're at the crossroads of an old civilization coming down and a new civilization being created. And people on this website that are listening to us, Julie, including you and myself, we are by definition called cultural creatives. We are the people that are looking outside the box for the answers of a way to survive on this planet, a planet that is rapidly descending into extinction right now. And cultural creatives are people that are open New ideas, new ways of life. How can we get through this? And guess what? There are many answers. And, and we're just on the dawn of something brand new. So I want to thank you, Julie, uh, uh, and everybody at Computers to, now, to 2K Now uh, uh, for allowing us to have this conversation. And I just wish that people understand that uh, we are actually in a very uh, wonderful position to evolve right now. Uh, and we have to get out of the fear because fear kills and hope will will bring us into the future. Now, Bruce, on your website, which I believe is brucelipton.com, do you have links to get the biology of belief, spontaneous evolution? Can people find more information? And if there are any upcoming classes, I know your other book's coming out in May. I'm excited for that one, too. Anything else you'd like to share with our viewers? Slipton.com has lots of articles that you can just download and read so you don't have to buy anything about this. There's articles on every aspect of the consciousness, the epigenetics, the new physics, uh, all of this coming together, plus lots of audio uh, uh, interviews and video interviews. So uh, it's a great source to, to, to get self-empowered. And, and, and I, love my, I love my work for this particular reason, Julie, and that is this. I get to go out and tell people how truly powerful they are. Uh, in a world where everybody else is trying to show them they're victims, it's like, no, no, this is a great time to wake up. And, and thank you for letting me have the soapbox for a bit uh, to, to talk about that. I love this. I truly appreciate your time. And you're welcome back anytime you want your books to talk about whatever. I, I would love it. Thanks so much for the invitation. All right, everyone. Thank you, Bruce Lipton. And everyone, get out there and have a great week. Actions. Read The Biology of Belief or any other of Bruce's books if you're moved to. Learn more about epigenetics. Google is your friend. See what you can find. Notice your negative thoughts. Are there any repetitive negative thoughts that you have? Create a plan to monitor your thoughts and turn the positive into the negative. Observe your physical health. Do you notice any correlation between your thoughts and how you are feeling physically? On our next episode, we're talking about optimism. Go out, clear the clutter to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. Are you ready to live a more joyful and fulfilling life? Sign up for our newsletter at reawakenyourbrilliance.com and receive a free copy of 10 Steps to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out. If you enjoyed today's episode, I would love it if you would rate and review the show because it really helps us in the search ranking. See you next Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Remember, when you clear your clutter, you can create the life you desire. Thank you.